Welcome to the Lindemann Engineering Suspension Seminar. My name is Ed Sorbo and I'm your suspension guy. I want to thank Tony and Rob for helping me make the video. What we're going to talk about today is an explanation of the overall suspension stuff like your springs have this job and your damping has this job so that you can understand what I'm talking about when you call me and we talk about the details of whatever your particular motorcycle needs. So to start with, we got springs. The spring's job is to hold up the mass of you and the motorcycle in the correct part of the travel, okay? So a spring is just made out of a piece of wire and we can make that wire into any shape we want. Hence this fork spring demo tapered on both ends and two different rates. So this is a progressively wound spring. Think of a spring as a piece of wire. The longer the wire, the easier it is to bend. Therefore, the weaker the spring is, okay? A shorter wire, bigger spaces in between is a stronger spring. A little spaces in between, more wire, a weaker spring. Okay, that's a progressively wound spring. This, <clears throat> oh, the reason that fork springs are sometimes tapered is so that there's less metal to move against the inside of the fork and make noise. Doesn't matter in how the spring does a job. This is a shock spring, linear rate spring, which is what we prefer, okay? When we talk about how strong or weak a spring is, and notice I said strong or weak, the nomenclature doesn't matter a lot. Most people say soft and hard because there's an S and an H on the clickers on their suspension and they just use that. But the spring's job is to hold up the mass and therefore talking about its strength is a more accurate description of what it's actually doing, which makes it easier for you to understand its job and therefore easier to come up with the correct answer to a given problem. So. The way we talk about the strength of the spring is its rate, R-A-T-E, okay? And we can measure the rate of the spring in any measuring system we want. The three common ones are Newton meters, kilograms per millimeter, and foot pounds, or pounds per foot. So in our example, we're gonna use pounds per foot because most Americans think better that way. Let's pretend this spring has a rate of 100 pounds. If I put 100 pounds on top of this spring, it will compress one inch. Simple enough, right? If I put 200 pounds on top, it compresses two inches, okay? That's spring rate, and that's a linear example, okay? The next thing we can do with a spring is we can preload it. We can store energy in the spring. We do that by mechanically shortening the spring with a threaded collar or the steps on your shock or the threaded adjuster in your fork, okay? If I compress this 100 pound spring one inch, there's 100 pounds of energy stored in the spring. The spring is pushing up with 100 pounds of force, like a runner in the blocks ready to go, okay? If I then put 100 pounds on top of that spring, nothing happens. The spring's already pushing up with 100 pounds of force. You put 100 pounds on top, it's just holding that force there. There's 100 pounds stored in the spring. When I put another 100 pounds on top, now it compresses it the second inch. Okay, think of preload as a difference between holding a heavy weight out here, lots of preload, or here, a little bit of preload. Less preload, better control. Okay, check my notes here, make sure we covered everything. So, springs hold up the mass of the motorcycle. They are stronger or weaker when we talk about their rate. We can change the rate and we can change the preload. Okay. The next thing we want to do is control the spring as it moves up and down. We use the damping to do that. Damping controls how fast or slow the suspension can move up and down. Again, different from the more common nomenclature, which is harder and softer, I think fast and slow is more accurate. If you say hard or soft, I'll know what you're talking about. Um, all damping works by taking oil from here making it go over there and then bringing it back. In the simplest system, a damper rod fork, you have a hole for the compression direction and a different hole for the rebound direction. So by changing the size of the hole or the number of the holes, you can control the speed at which the suspension moves up and down separately for compression and rebound. Compression is when the suspension is getting shorter. Rebound is when it's extending, hence the names. Um, so compression is the front side of a bump. Rebound is the back side of the bump. F compression is when you roll off the throttle to shift. Rebound is when you get back on the throttle, okay? The problem with the damper rod, of course, the limitation is you got one hole size. 
And although the suspension can move up and down at any speed, unlimited speeds from fast to slow, you can break it down into fast, medium, and slow. What moves your suspension slowly? Rolling on and off the throttle, leaning into and out of a corner. What moves your suspension at a medium speed is hard braking, and bumps make the suspension move fast. So if I've got only one hole size, I'm gonna have to choose fast, medium, or slow as my most important thing, and the other two speeds are gonna be a compromise. Okay, so that's what we do with a, with a damper rod fork. By the way, I love damper rod forks. I have a really good compromise that's gonna make you super, super happy. And I don't think that you have to spend, it's definitely not worth the increased cost of buying a cartridge to replace your damper rod fork. So we got tired of having those limitations and we invented a cartridge system, which is what's in a shock and in your forks. The difference between a shock and a fork is the length. So in a shock, you gotta get all the stuff to fit into a small space. Hence, there's one piston with a shim stack on the top and the bottom. In a fork, you can have, you got a lot more space. You can have a piston over here for rebound and a piston down there for compression. But they're all doing the same job. And what they are doing is we've replaced the hole in the damper rod with a piston that has a port. It's the same damn thing, it's just a different name. But now, because we have a stack of flexible shims on the top, we can control the size of the hole. So the oil's trying to go through the hole and the shims are bending open more or less depending on their strength. And so I can build a shim stack that opens up a little bit when you're pushing oil through slowly and more and more and more, the faster, the more force you have behind the oil. The work is all in the shim stack. Whether the shim stack, one on top and one underneath for compression and rebound or two separate ones makes no difference. The principle is the same, okay? So to review, we have a way of controlling oil going from here to there and back again. We have a slightly more sophisticated way where we can change the hole size. And we do that by building a different shim stack. There's one other part going on. When the suspension's moving really slowly, there's not enough force to bend the shim stack open. So we have a small little hole in the shaft and the oil can go in through there on one side of the piston and out through the hole on the other side of the piston. And then, to be really cool, we put a needle inside there with a little screw. By moving that needle in and out of the hole, we change the size of the hole. That is your clicker that's on your fork or your shock. The thing to understand about these clickers is that they are controlling the low speed bleed. They're not controlling the compression damping or the rebound as in all of it, only the low speed. So when you roll on and off the throttle, all the oil is going through that little passage. As opposed to when you're moving the suspension fast enough to bend the shim stack open, all the oil goes through the port. So in a damper rod system, all the oil always goes through the hole. In a cartridge system, sometimes the oil goes through here, sometimes the oil goes through there. By having these more circuits, like in a carburetor you have a pilot circuit and a, and a needle and a main jet, right? By dividing all the work up to different circuits, we can more finely tune the stuff. But it's important for you, the owner of the bike, changing your clickers to understand what you're actually changing. So your clicker adjusts the attitude of the bike before the energy event. The energy event is the bump or the shift or the corner that makes the suspension move up and down, okay? So if your bike is taller or shorter before you run over the energy event, then the bike's gonna work differently. That's what your clicker is doing for you. I hope that makes sense. If you have any questions, give me a call. Rob says it makes sense. Uh, if you have any questions, give me a call, 909-838-4587 or email ed at le-suspension.com. I just wanna say that this can be kinda of confusing. There's lots of information. Check out the uh, links on my homepage. Do that experiment that talks about how your adjusters work. So if you get confused, just remember that you're standing on a planet that's evolving and revolving at 900 miles an hour. It's orbiting at 19 miles a second, so it's reckoned a sun that is a source of all our power. The sun and you and me and all the stars that we can see are moving at a million miles a day in an outer spiral arm 30,000 light years long of a galaxy we call the Milky Way. Thanks for watching.